this is our kind of discussion session. And uh, it's got the sort of relatively dry title of how best to share knowledge about inference methods. OK, but hopefully we're going to make this a bit more fun and a bit more interactive. And so what we've got up here is we've got a list of essentially things that we think might be you know, problems with the way in which we currently go about thinking about sharing inference methods. Uh, and I want people to try and come up, well, people first of all to sort of offer an explanation of, of, of what the, each of these different things are and then say whether or not you agree. OK. Have we got any takers? Any I'll bring the mic around so we can capture it. Yeah, do you want to... Uh, does, do anybody wanna... know, does anybody know what Gollum says in Lord of the Rings? Yeah, that's right, exactly. So, yeah, Gollum, Gollum syndrome is... Uh, or maybe you want to say, Dave, because... Yeah, you're, so, you're... yeah, this is one that uh, I've thought about quite a bit. So, Gollum syndrome is it's mine, it's precious. So, you publish your work in a way that it's not straightforward to reproduce it or even figure out how it's been done uh, and you publish it in little slivers as you go along so that you can get the maximum out of the publications for yourself without giving anything away to the rest of the community <laughs> so it's mine it's precious i'm not giving it to anybody else that's all that one's about <laughs> and i guess a, a sort of follow-up to that is do, do people think that that's relevant at all in the in the in the sort of inference literature has anyone had had that problem before I feel, yeah, it, it makes intuitive sense, right? You, if you think of a clever technique and you want to publish it soon, you might be hesitant to give too many details away in conferences because if someone else is like, well, that is a cool idea, I'll try it. But also they're better at science than you. They'll use it and then publish it. And you're like, well, <laughs> you're not publishing it after all. Um, so it makes sense. OK, anyone else got a view on kind of Gollum syndrome, if it's something they've come across in their work? I'm not sure it's something I fully recognize. Certainly the, the sort of aspect of splitting your work into as many slivers as possible to get publications out of it is, is something which we are clearly incentivized to do in some way. But I think, at least from, from my experience, the kind of incentive is also there to make your work moderately easy to reproduce or to use, because that's how you get citations. Yeah, I think the second one's used, we should put salami slicing up there. That's what my <laughs> boss used to call that one. <laughs> I think it's probably more common in um, experimental areas where people don't typically publish all the details. What reagent did you use? You've got to write to them and they'll tell you, but not necessarily included. In yeah, is it, you have a pretty good story about that. Is that you with one of your PhD yeah, students? Uh, yeah. uh, actually, there's a student with Helen. So we had a student a few years ago. I uh, actually did experiments. A mathematician was doing experiments himself, and after three months, he couldn't get it to work. So eventually, so I just write, write to the authors of the paper that you were trying to reproduce the results from, and that was exactly what happened. They wrote back, so oh, did we put that reagent in? It wasn't quite that one. It was this one. <laughs> and then it all worked. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I, th I think we've covered sort of, you know, Gollum syndrome. Um, OK, anyone got a view on any of these other things, whether they, they have any meaning, personal meaning to you, and whether they're relevant for this discussion? I should say, I've just, most of these we just made up. So it, 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 won't, it won't necessarily have too much meaning to you. Um, uh, so one I do like, which is Dave's one, is discipline-induced obfuscation. Does anyone want to have a guess, hazard a guess as to what that means, and does that seem to hold? Do you want to go, Dave? Yeah. That one's mine. <laughs> so discipline-induced obfuscation. So a lot of machine learning and inference methods get published in hardcore uh, theoretical statistics or applied probability journals, and therefore have to adhere to the format of those journals and the nomenclature and all of the background theory of those journals, when in fact they've been quite simple algorithms if you just write it down in pseudocode. So it's pretty obfuscated. You can't understand what it is trying to do. If you read it as a non you know, non-mathematician particularly, uh, trying to read through them is really, really difficult. But it's only induced by the 
discipline itself. It's, that's the way you get it published in that particular journal, and that's the way you've got to write it. And when you actually get down to the algorithm, I, I, for years I thought MCMC was this amazing thing until I actually looked at the algorithm and thought, oh, that, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Is that all it is? <laughs> And it's one of the main reasons that we organised this conference um, um, was the, to try and get people that work on making methods together with people that actually use them and try and get them to speak a common language for a bit, um, if only for two days. Um, um, so we could ask, if, is there any solution to that? What's an obvious solution to this? Anybody? Robin was giving you. Yeah. Go that way. And then we'll, go, we'll come to the back. So I think this is something that the mathematicians, statisticians, machine learning people can use to their advantage because you actually double the number of, pop of papers, you publish it in the theoretical and then you publish it in the applied. And if you like me and you play in lots of people's yards, you can publish in the applied many times because <laughs> you apply it lots of times and your citations shoot up. So I think that's a thing we have to get out of, of only publishing in our own literature that and to some extent, institutions have to start rewarding people for publishing mm. outside their literatures. Um, that papers like that have to count in the ref, for yeah. instance. We're all ref focused at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think that, that it is, it's a serious problem, but it, it's in our own hands to solve that problem. Um, I think it was Philip who once told me that the maths institute here refused to let somebody put a nature paper in for the ref. <laughs> Because it wasn't a maths journal. It's true, isn't it? It was actually true. It wasn't a maths journal, so it couldn't go in the red. I feel like what just for the word obvious solution, which might or not ob might not always help. Um, if if it's going, even if it's in a very theoretical journal, just having the equivalent of a graphical abstract, having the pseudocode or a nice flowchart, even if you shove it in supplementary, so that someone who does maths but doesn't actually know any maths, like myself, um, can read through the paper and not have to understand what on earth is happening with all the theorems and proofs, and just go look at the flowchart. It's nice. <laughs> Or even better, software that goes with it, that implements the algorithm. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's a matter of talking to each other. So I think that conferences like these are a precious opportunity because uh, when you try to talk with some experimentalist or uh, statistician or mathematician or physicist, uh, the terminology sometimes is very different, but we mean the same. <laughs> the notation is extremely different, but I mean, with some perturbation and using dx or dots or whatever, we are using the same equation. Um, so having conferences where we try to, I think that that's the ideal size of a conference from my uh, own taste. Because if it's too big, then you don't have the chance of really talking and making the networking, which is all what is about <laughs> a conference. So having conferences where you kind of invite people from the experimental side or working on from a uh, applied size and making the mathematical modeling and having inference applying inference so because i mean one thing is designing the algorithm one thing is running through the real model and the real data where you have all the tuning getting in and all the problem that you don't have when you run the code on simulated data on your real uh, toy model right um, so that and also numerical analysis because i think that we're all using more or less uh, simulation uh, in our research at different levels. So also having those uh, will help. So more opportunities like this uh, will definitely be beneficial. Thanks. Okay, any other points on, on, on this one, discipline-induced obfuscation? No? We should market these. We should, we should. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to market. Copyright. Yeah. <laughs> you can make a scratch on the slide. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, what are the other things here? Uh, I've got to remember, some of these I made up literally on, on Sunday. So, um, so um, cycle of inference misery. I won't actually ask anyone to, to say what this means, because I think I've actually sort of proselytized a little bit over the last couple of days about this. Um, is essentially, this is, this is something that, that we coined um, working on our software for doing inference, which is something we noticed that happens with, with particularly early career 
uh, uh, researchers, uh, PhD students, uh, postdocs, or anyone that's really just coming afresh to the inference kind of literature, is that often what happens is that you're modeling a particular system, you know, a particular biological system or a physical system or, or whatever. So then what you do is you sort of built your model and you're really proud of yourself. And then your supervisor goes up, it says to you, oh, do you, can you just fit that to these data that we've got? And so then you go away and you read the, you know, the Journal of Statistical Research for Statisticians. <laughs> um, and then you, you, you sort of, you wade through that Latin and then you, and then you code the particular method up uh, and you're kind of happy with yourself, you're semi-happy with yourself at this point. And then you go ahead and you try and do inference. And I can't say the number of times that I've watched my MC's, MCMC chains do this, right? We've all been in this position before when we're trying to fit a model and the chains look something like this, right? So then what do you do? Well, then what you do is you go back to the statistical literature, you find a new method, and you repeat the cycle, right? And it's such a waste of time. <laughs> and we noticed it happening time and time again with new students that were coming in. And that was why we decided to make some software which basically you know, had, this, had lots of different inference methods in it. And this isn't a plug for that. It's just saying that this, this sort of cycle seems to happen quite a lot when we're trying to fit models to data, particularly models that are ODEs or, or sort of PDEs, which are often have identifiability issues, right, which are quite complicated. So I don't know, does this ring true with anyone else? I'm, I'm guessing there's some sort of giggling here, meaning that perhaps some people sort of think that it might be the case, but does anyone have a comment on it or a solution? Well, it's definitely not a solution, but again, if you make the code available um, and the toy example, I mean, in a way that any figures that is in your paper can be reproduced by anyone, uh, using the shared available code, that would be a good starting point. So I can understand whether, I mean, basically it would be a plug and play. I replace the inner data that they have with my data and I see if I get something comparable. Uh, obviously, the pedagogic thing is try to code your own, uh, I yeah. mean, to write down and code your own uh, scheme and then compare with that. But you need to have a, the benchmark. And if the benchmark of the way famous Latin paper is not available, then uh, <laughs> it's a problem. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, thank you. Oh. I think kind of following on from that, um, the one thing that I think kind of helped me to maybe escape from the cycle of inference misery was kind of probabilistic programming languages, I think can be really quite, uh, there's lots of these. So there's like Stan, there's like Turing and Julia, there's like lots of these things with different kinds of they, they will have different algorithms that they can use. But the advantage there is that you can kind of code your model once and you really have to put in a bit of work to understand how to make your model like work within their framework. But it can be quite beneficial because you can often try out more than one different method and you know the implementation is going to be right because someone else has tested it in a bunch of in a bunch of ways, you know that it's not just that your implementation of the algorithm has is, is gone wrong and your understanding of the algorithm is not quite right. So kind of using other people's implementations of algorithms can be really helpful. And I guess I guess it's the same kind of point as saying if the code's available, that's really going to help. And if if you have a kind of slightly more plug and play avail available, yeah, with a probabilistic programming language, maybe that can really help with this kind of thing. I think I'll just concur with everyone else who already said having the code available is very helpful, especially um, I think in the past when, when I write papers, maybe not inference papers, just modeling papers, usually I'll prepare something like a Jupyter notebook or like a MATLAB script where if you just click it without doing anything else, it's going to reproduce all the figures you see in the paper. I think the one, one part that's helpful is because it shows you exactly how those figures are produced and what exactly have I done to the data to get to that point. And also, sometimes the code would have hidden details in it that didn't really make it to the paper. Maybe those details are you know, conceptually not important, but practically it makes a difference. So for example, some minor optimizations that really speeds up the algorithm 
but the paper was about the math, so you d the, the readers don't really care about optimization. Or perhaps, um, you know, a, 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 some tweak about convergence to make your algorithm converge faster. And sometimes the code would make that clear why you need to do this, but that detail doesn't isn't in the text of the paper. So I just found that very helpful. I think it's a really good point, and and um, there's uh, the head of the research software engineering group here at Oxford, uh, Martin Robinson. He always says that he doesn't really like pseudocode because the best version of the actual model or the the routine itself is the code, right? Because the pseudocode never quite has all the details in it. So I think that's a really good point. Uh, yeah, just following on from some of the discussion that's already been said, but I think one of the issues often is that you're not quite sure what the reason for the, the failure and the inference is. So things like, you know, the, the lack of convergence in your chains, is it because you've just not waited long enough? Is it because um, you've chosen the wrong type of algorithm and if you switch to STAN with HMC, it might be better? Or is it because that parameter is not identifiable or the data isn't sufficiently good? And I think the, the best thing for that and what we would advise is that you look at or have a really good understanding of the model a priori. So before you try and do any inference, do the sensitivity analysis, do the identifiability analysis, look at the information and the data. You know, is it sensible to do estimation based on what you have? Um, and then you know that if it doesn't work, then it's likely because the inference algorithm you've chosen probably isn't optimal for that, rather than the fact that there just isn't any chance or hope of estimating something statistically. Um, based on your current setup. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. I think that the uh, it's always tempting to move to a new algorithm because you think that's going to cure all your woes. But really, a lot of the time, it's just an identifiability issue. And so one of the things I think additional to what you said was that we think is really useful is whenever you've got a, uh, a new problem, uh, a new model that you're trying to fit to some data, some real data, is to simulate some data from the model and then try and fit to that as a first step. It's always really, really tempting when you've got your hands on some great experimental data or something, to just to reach in and just try and infer it straight away, but often that's not the right approach. I don't think anyway. But. Yeah, I'd go further. I think it's a crime not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Do we have any other, any other points on this? I think I agree with everyone on the value of doing things like providing the code. I do want to comment that, as everyone who is in this room and written code is aware, this is also a substantial amount of additional work, right, to both not just write your code, but write it in a way that can be used by other people. And having experienced this both on my own projects, where I think a substantial part of the value I provided was writing good, good documentation, and then also from some papers that I've reviewed where they did provide the code and I went to the GitHub page and tried to run it and like they had scripts that I think they thought I would be able to run and I just totally couldn't. So it is worth doing and it will also take work. Yeah, and I think that, um, again, speaking to Martin Robinson um, here, head of uh, research software engineering, he actually made the point the other day, which is that should, should statisticians ever be coding up the methods themselves for use by others? In the sense of, should it actually be statisticians or should it be research software engineers? Right? I mean, these things are really complicated. And, and, and coding up something in a way that is e empathetic to others in terms of like how are they eventually going to use it is really non-trivial. But I think it has such great value to do so. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I work a lot with um, models, just sharing models where you have similar things like this, where a lot of the stuff that's in the model code isn't in the paper. Um, and one issue that we have then in looking back at those is that you don't know which, which if they disagree, you don't know which one is right. <laughs> so in our big uh, cardiac model database, we have some models where i fairly certain the implementation is wrong. Um, but there's also ones where the implementation differs from the paper, and I know, because I talk to the authors, that the implementation is the correct one. Uh, but there's no way to guess this unless, you know, you happen to know the right people. So we should probably start doing things like um, having errata or something. Uh, like, I've not always put code with all papers, but I have made it available now. And so if people go to my website, they can find it. But I would quite like to go back and maybe say to the papers, can I just 
tack on. By the way, here's the link. Um, Just backing up Aidan's point on how long it takes. When we started developing some of our software with Philip, actually in 2006, I think it was, which is Chased, which is still going, uh, we didn't publish a paper for three years. It took us three years to get to a point where we'd done anything original enough that we could publish a paper. That's a pretty big thing. That's a whole defil length. So, yeah, it's a really good point. that it, if, you, if you're going to go for it in a big way, Pints has been something similar. Um, so we haven't quite got the main Pints paper out yet. We've got a, a mini one out, but not the main one. Um, just takes a long time to get up and running. So, not for the faint-hearted. The point on um, published code being different to models reminded me of the last workshop I went to, which was an industrial workshop related more to pharmaceutical modeling. Um, they talked about one of these speakers was someone who curates a website called BioModels, which I almost imagine as a counterpart to BioNumbers. It's just a uh, a database of biological models, lots of them in SBML and so on and so forth. Uh, they in-house try to curate the models that are submitted to them to verify that they work, and they, they published a paper on their efforts doing this, and their criteria was basically, if we can reproduce at least one of the figures in the paper using the model as stated or their code, then it was a verifiable paper. And rather like the fiasco of social science, they managed this with about 25% of published papers, uh, even though these are the papers that tried to give them the model. Um, that percentage went up to 40% if they could get hold of the authors and ask them what's happened. And there'll be, there'll be things like, oh, this parameter was, oh, was reported wrongly, or there's, here's a bug that you can fix in this way. So it's, uh, if we started doing this, we'd probably find that it'd be pretty abysmal. <laughs> So a lot of our interest in software came from exactly that kind of thing. So when we set up the DTC in 2002, one of the first things we did, and this again was for one of Philip's courses, was get students to start trying to reproduce uh, results from cancer models, standard cancer models in the literature. I reckon it was about that, maybe 20%, some 25%, we could do it. And that started getting us quite worried. <laughs> so then we started thinking about how we, ta we taught programming and software engineering. Um, and I've gone from there ever since. So we've become evangelists a little bit for this. <laughs> okay, so uh, just uh, I guess back to our our uh, Hydra, uh, our many headed headed Hydra. Um, okay, so fragile, fragile outputs. Does anyone have an idea as to what that might mean? It's not reproducible. You've done it once and you go, okay, they're the results I want, and then you move on. But who knows whether you'd get the same thing again and again. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely one part of it. Does anyone have any other thoughts on what that might mean? Yeah, so it's just been said, sensitivity of choice to the hyperparameters, um, just for the online people. Um, yeah, spot on. So the number, so one of the things actually that is really, really, it's, it's not comical, it's horrible, but the, what, what happens often is that you get, if you're coding up a method yourself, I think we've all been in this position where, uh, particularly with inference algorithms, you often don't know whether the, there's something wrong with your implementation or whether it's the fact that the algorithm is so sensitive to hyperparameters and you haven't tuned them properly. And I think that tuning of hyperparameters generally is just such a, un well, perhaps it's a recognized problem, but not, not enough in, in inference methods. Just uh, the number of time where uh, in developing our software that we've used, uh, that we've created points, uh, which basically just has loads and loads of different inference methods in it. And we code up a method and we try it on a load of problems and it, it either doesn't work or, or it sort of does work on some of the problems sensitive on the hyperparameters. It's just really hard to know because verifying the correctness of, of, of sampling algorithms is kind of a completely unsolved problem, just inference al algorithms in general. So if anyone's got any sort of ideas about how we could test the validity of, 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 of inference algorithms, it'd be really great to, great to hear any. I know Remy did, but Remy, I think, has got on a yeah. Eurostar to go back to... Go back to Lille. Yeah, sure. Good. There's a, a paper that comes to mind called uh, 
well, I don't remember what the paper is called, but there's is about a method called simulation-based calibration. By you know about this already? Okay. Yeah, so it's an interesting one. Is, is anyone else familiar with simulation-based calibration? It's a Bayesian method that, that sort of came out a few years ago. Um, yeah, we, we actually tried it. it was, it's got a funny one because it sort of fits into this paradigm quite nicely, actually. Whereas the people came up with it, sort of said it was a really good way of uh, verifying the correctness of your MCMC algorithms, but it doesn't really work in the majority of circumstances. This is what we found anyway with applied examples. Um, what, what did you find was, was wrong with it? It's just very sensitive to the choice of priors. Is, the, is one of the things that we found. Effectively, it, it isn't a criticism of that method, it's just saying that actually it was kind of interesting that we tried that method, actually it didn't, didn't have much practical success with it. But. So, to give a brief plug to um, the, the Big Data Institute up the hill here in Oxford, they have a, they have a group there led by Jerome Kelleher, who um, run a kind of project with a similar flavor to what we're talking about here to do with um, simulation of synthetic DNA sequence data from models in genetics and uh, these things these things being random pseudo random algorithms as well it, it's sort of quite hard to validate that an algorithm is doing what it's what it's purports to be doing and I think the best way they've come up with is extremely labor intensive which is they for any model which kind of they want to add to their library or which an author asks to be added to the library, they implement it at least twice, um, huh. completely independently, hopefully getting one of these implementations from the original authors, then recreate it from scratch, not looking at the original code. And that more or less enables you to sort of check that at least the two outputs agree um, in distribution. And yeah, I, I know they've thought about these sorts of things quite hard and haven't come up with anything better than that. <laughs> I wonder whether there is anything better than that, ultimately. I once asked a famous numerical analyst how you show that a code is correct, and he said exactly the same thing. He said, code it up in two independent ways, and if they give you the same answer, that's the best you can do. <laughs> we think there are other things you can do. We think you can start setting up benchmark problems, which are just standard benchmark problems, which are an entire community. This is what I discussed with Remy last night. Uh, an entire community agrees are good benchmark problems, and your new algorithm has to do at least as well as at least one of the other algorithms, and preferably a little bit better before you can get it published. <laughs> and that could be automatic. You could put that on, on the front. Before you even get it to go to referees, you could automate all of that. But it would require a group a bit like this to come up with a standard set of benchmark problems that we all thought were okay. And of course, you can add to that. It's not, a fine, it's not the final set. As if somebody comes along with a really cool um, problem that nobody else can solve and they can, and they can solve one of the other ones, then that might be good enough to get admitted. Something like that. Anyway. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's really related to this, but uh, one of my personal problems is actually the lack of time. I mean, uh, one will have, one will need way more time to go through the literature and uh, explore existing methods and have time to understand them and go through everything in details to then be able to compare your meter in, in a proper manner with all the technical details and so on. But the overall system makes you uh, rushing in a way that you have your meters, you try on a few examples, you compare with one model as a benchmark if you already are on a good side in a way and if things work that's it um, so I mean it's I think that it should be a collective effort of the whole uh, group of the whole society a scientific society to kind of go back to the fact that it's not a matter of number of publication per year uh, number of citation but the quality of the article and this will will definitely improve the the quality of the of the research because I mean you need time and in the UK system the way of getting time is getting a grant and the way of getting a grant is having time to write the grant <laughs> which you don't. I think you raised another really interesting point which is about the context of use of models so if you've got a range of different benchmark problems then it's fine to have a method that doesn't do well on all of them it's just knowing that there are certain classes of problem where your method does well and ones where it doesn't. 
I think is really, really key. So I think that just getting away from this approach where basically what, what happens in publications, as you just said, is that you try it on a few different models and you include generally those that it works on and maybe a couple where it doesn't. So you look a bit honest. Um, <laughs> But if you, but if you get away, if we can get away from that, then I think that you, you know, just recognizing that there are faults in methods and the fact that you know they won't work in all circumstances, I think that would just be such a valuable resource for the community to sort of you know, the, the applied users of software to say, oh, okay, well, I've got this type of problem, and I know from the benchmarks that this type of problem tends to work well with this method. Yeah, but the problem is that sometimes you already had the follow-up paper on the, <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the sample where the things doesn't work. With the follow-up paper. and maybe you don't want to publish one unique paper covering all possible models, you start releasing the argument because maybe you already talk and you already share the idea and you are afraid that someone else is going to call because if you're on your own versus a group of 20 people, obviously, that makes a difference. Uh, so you don't want to publish, make, publish that and you don't want to say that loud because there can be people faster than you. Fair yeah, I guess it's easy for me to say I'm old and grey and I don't need to care anymore. Um, just based on what you said about the RSC team and thinking about, you know, who cares enough about the re reproducibility in order to actually dedicate time to it, um, maybe it's also, you know, who cares enough to dedicate money to it. Um, perhaps RSC budget time should come like a standard in grants for work that that you know is going to be implemented by other people if you're developing new methods, new models, new code. The RSC time should come almost as standard. Like um, if your if your grant proposition doesn't include it, there should be like a red flag. Like why do you not care if your work is if reproducible? Um, saying that though, if every paper that people were publishing needed to go through the RSC team, I think they would have a, an incredibly high workload all, all of a sudden. So considering RSC teams are, are already relatively new, they might need to be expanded a bit to accommodate that, but it could be a possible idea that you just need extra grant funding for it, really. I think Dave will be able to comment very well on that, given that oh. <laughs> you set up the Oxford yeah. <laughs> RSC group. So you, you probably noticed I was bashing away at the back of the room. It was to write a proposal to the university to expand, to, well, triple the size of our RSC group for exactly this reason, which so it's quite amusing. But the Software Sustainability Institute, which I was involved with for a few years, which is based in Edinburgh mainly, I've been campaigning for that for years. Um, but we're getting there. I mean, uh, UCL's RSE group has now got 35 people in it, so it's grown since 2010 to that size. And if you count their advanced research computing centre, they've got 80 odd. So some universities are really going down this road. But I think that's where we're going. I think Ben's right. I mean, software is so important that we've got to go in this direction. It underpins everything. Uh, when the SSI did a survey a few years ago, 96% of respondents from all disciplines said they couldn't do their, they, they were reliant on. Um, research software and 69% said they couldn't do their research without it. It doesn't matter what the discipline, that's in humanities, never mind what we do. So since it's so important, people are starting to think about it. I think it's, it is, and, and we'll come on to it in a bit, but the only way really to solve it is to do it as a community. We have to start developing software collectively. It might be supported by RSEs, but we can't do one. We, we can't build the entire repository. One person cannot build the entire repository, as you say, and compare to benchmarks because it just takes too much time for one individual to do it. But if collectively we build that repository, then we can start making progress, I think. Um, so we'll probably say a bit about that later. Yeah, and I think that one of the good follow-ups on that, to Aidan's point actually earlier, is that often code that's implemented in, in GitHub repositories, um, because it's not implemented by people that actually know how to build software, and because, and, and not only that, but because it's often implemented idiosyncratically, it means that whenever you go and you want to use a new bit of software, you have to learn something new. And so you know, having common interfaces to things, which would only come about if you, you agree on community standards or if you work together as a community, I think would be really so useful. There's a survey, isn't there? I can't remember the numbers of how many times uh, software that's on, a, on the GitHub repository has been visited after it was first deposited. And something like 90% of it is never visited again. It's just put there because some funder says it's got to be put there. It's, some, it's most of it. You know, it's a vast majority of it. Nobody, it's only there because somebody said, I've made it open source in the paper, so they had to stick it there. Um, so that tells its own story, I think. It's good for Microsoft, I guess. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, just back a, um, a, a couple of steps about the kind of database of kind of test problems or things that you might want to do to test your algorithms. The kind of closest thing that I've come across to that is there is um, a kind of package called posterior DB, which is like a database of best Bayesian posterior kind of inference problems. And that's kind of specific. At the, at the moment, it's a bit limited because it's kind of organized by the people that make Stan. Um, so it's kind of specific to people that make a particular bit of software and so a bit biased to the types of problems that their software works well for. Um, it doesn't really have any biological stuff, st based stuff in it. So, but that's kind of the closest kind of uh, similar orientated kind of database. And they do have things like kind of gold standard MCMC drawers for those types of problems. So if you have a new algorithm that you want to test, you can see what does your algorithm get versus the kind of current gold standard and things like this. That's a good lead into your going back to the Hydra, isn't it? <laughs> the, uh, which, which one? <laughs> the bottom. Uh, well, yeah, the bottom one, probably. Uh, Software for the creators. I suppose, yeah. That's what I thought that was. Yeah, no. I, <laughs> I think that's what that about. Yeah, so I guess it could be taken in that way. So, <laughs> I yeah, so I know that software. It's actually it's really good that package. Um, uh, and yeah, they so they run stands MCMC, don't they, for a long time on uh, a bunch of uh, benchmark problems, and then you can compare your model to the, to those effectively. Um, so yeah, I think that's exactly the sort of thing that we're talking about doing. Um, but I guess we, what we'd also want to go along with that would be sort of resource where you actually had access to the models as well. Because one of the things that, you know, would be great is that every if every time you published your, your model, uh, a paper based on a model, then it, then it was immediately available to the consumers of that model. Right, at the moment it's not, because as Dave said, it sits in a GitHub repository and sort of, yeah, uh, helps, helps uh, worsen climate change because you need some cloud space to store it in. Um, but it doesn't do much else. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good point. Okay, um, I guess related to that actually was uh, marketing personal panaceas. Yeah, that's what that's the right one, isn't it? Right <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, so I think that one's possibly a bit more obvious than some of the other ones. But does anyone w have a comment on that and whether they think that's that's relevant? Stan being a good example. <laughs> so Stan might be a good example of this. I I, I think Stan's great. Stan's great. Stan's Stan's great. great. I, 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 but it is I, a good example. Yeah, Stan is absolutely fantastic. And I think that the, for example, the research software engineering that it goes behind Stan and all the sort of work and the back end is, it's the reason it's become so popular. It's because they've done all that work and they've got a huge community. They've got a huge grant from um, DARPA in the US. Um, but, <laughs> but the you know Stan, I don't think it necessarily aims to do this. To be fair, um, but there are models. So I guess why we started thinking about this originally is that the models that Dave's group works with here, and um, they're sort of big ODEs or PDE models, and uh, trying to implement those models in Stan is 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 kind of a it's problematic because. Uh, that you know, numerical an analysis, um, how you solve systems of ODEs and PDs, has been around for a long time, and there are very good ways in which you go about doing that. So having to reinvent the wheel just to put it inside Stan, and then B, the problem being that often once you've got it into Stan, because the gradient, Stan needs gradients. I don't know how much people know about Stan, but Stan, you need the gradients of the log likelihood function, and to be quite specific about this, and if you want to calculate the gradients of the log likelihood function if you've got an ODE or a PDE, you then have to work out the sensitivities of the ODE or PDE solutions with respect to the parameters, which is really, really expensive for these big systems. And so what we, I guess we found initially was when we went into uh, to try and code up and these models in, in Stan and then try and do inference on them, it would just kind of fall over. I had this experience where I spend a lot of my time in Stan, I love the software, but and um, I've also, I used to have a lot more hair, like, before, <laughs> before I started using Stan. And, and so what I used to do is, you know, uh, you, you, you code up your model, you set it going, and then, you know, you wait in R or Python, and it's like you're waiting for the, number, the next printout of the next iterations to arrive. And it's like, okay, so I've been here, I've been here five minutes, and I'm, I haven't got my first ten iterations. <laughs> 
and you know you're going to be waiting for a few you know a few days to get your result and then once you get your result is it actually converged ah uh, so you see what I mean? I'm not trying to critique Stan here at all. I think it's great software, but it, it has its context of use again. I think it's that there are some models where it works really, really well for, which are models where you've got lots and lots of parameters and the expense of calculating the likelihood is really, really low. But whenever you move to situations where you've got a really expensive system to forward simulate like an ODE or a PD, perhaps it's not necessarily the right software for that. Um, <laughs> So sorry, I went off on one a bit there, but um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, essentially uh, about marketing personal panaceas. Again, it's just do we expect that one bit of one particular code is gonna is gonna solve all our inference problems? Probably not. So I think that again, just if we could work together as a community to make all of these different algorithms available, then perhaps we can solve all problems through a common bit of software. But only if we work together as a community, I would say. Um, but anyway, that's my bit. Does, does anyone have have a comment on that at all? If anybody does try and re-implement nuts, the algorithm that's published in the papers is not the algorithm that's in the software, because we reverse engineered it and we know that. So, so if you want to know how to do it, get in touch with Martin Robinson and he'll tell you or Fergus who's here. Yeah, I think that's a case. So I think David, you also worked on this as well, didn't you? And on, on, a bit on re-implementing nuts. And, and actually, we had a. So Martin worked on on implementing the no U-turn sampler, which is the algorithm behind Stan. Um, because it, it was published in a series of um, slightly discipline-induced obfuscation papers. <laughs> um, I, I, over, I, I, I could go around the things, but over the last few years, um, there's a particular offending author who I won't, I won't mention. But like, they effectively, it made it very, very hard to reproduce this, the, this, this, um, uh, this method. And so we had to just dig into the guts of, of Stan and just basically just try and pull it out. And it took us absolutely ages to work it out. And we also found ourselves in this position a lot, where we sort of we try our method uh, on a load of method, uh, a load of problems, and it just doesn't work. And we know it doesn't stand. So okay, back to the drawing board. And um, and so, and then we had a, a, a so Martin coded up. We thought it was fine. And then we had a, a really great summer student that, that came and did a did a project with us. And then he was trying out Stan, uh, sorry, our version of nuts on a load of toy problems, and it didn't work. And so he found another bug that, 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 we, that we had found <laughs> that we hadn't met, actually seen in our own code. And so, you know, it's very hard to code up these complicated algorithms. Um, so, yeah, don't, we, we still keep meaning to get around to a paper where we're actually just going to write the pseudocode for the nuts algorithm. I think they're having some more recent attempts to do that. But, um, yeah, still a bit of a black box. It's one of the 15 papers we have written writing class. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, so what's next on our? Do you want to talk about the sloth of Despon, Dave? Uh, well, it's like the cycle of mis inference misery, really, isn't it? That's what sort of the sloth of Despon. It's another way of putting it. Uh, that you just go around this. Eventually, you lose heart because you, you go to the next one. If you go around that iterative loop um, enough, then you wind up in the sloth of Despon, which is, I think, a quote. Well, Dave, I think, I think Sorry, you, which is a quote from Pilgrim's Progress. Um, so, um, but it, it refers to this. You just go round and round and round in this, and eventually you give up. So you decide that all these methods are just magic, and you can't get them to work, and so um, you walk away from it, which is a shame because there's no reason to. There's probably something out there that will work for your problem, as we've seen over the last two days. I mean, people have come up with all. I love Solvig's talk, talk yesterday, actually, where you showed what was possible. Um, and you can you can see that for these parameters you might be able to do something, but for these other two you can't. That's fantastically informative. But you could look at that and think, oh, it's just not working. So once yeah. you've tried it hard, once you once you start to understand these methods, I think it's it can be really helpful. So do not despond. Do not fall into the sloth <laughs> of despond. Yeah, sure. So do you want to talk about that, Dave? Maybe. Yeah, sure. So this is. Somebody's talked about this. So it's how we move away from where we are at the moment, which is trying to publish a paper as quickly as you can. So this massive weighting of re global research effort towards publishing in the highest impact journal factor, impact factor journal you can possibly do, towards thinking about what actually contributes most uh, rapidly and most uh, usefully to the global research effort. And so we need to move back towards community-based stuff and think about the people we train, how we train them, and what we produce collectively instead of individually thinking about how can I 
you know, up my H index or up my impact factor, up the impact factor of the things I publish in, so that I can get that next job. Um, and I think we're moving towards that because there's things like the Dora Convention, which is Declaration on Research Assessment, I think it is, uh, which says you, you've got to actually read a paper before you assess it. You can't just use bibliometrics. You've got to actually read it and see whether it's any good, as opposed to just judging it on whether it got published in Nature or whatever. And then there's a swing towards, for more senior academics, of judging us by the people we train. This is something Philip's talked about a lot in the past, um, which is, I think, is a much better way of judging somebody than the outputs. I mean, what, what are the, the people you work with, your PhD students and postdocs who, who pass through your group, what do they go on to do? They go on to do interesting things. It doesn't have to be in academia, it doesn't have to be in research, but they go off, off and do interesting things in the world. And that's a much better metric as to what we're trying to do in universities than these leading scientific publications. And all that goes towards the global research community. So are we actually contributing to that in everything that we do? And hopefully the next research evaluation framework might include a bit more of that. I think there are indicators that it will, because things always swing too far. So we're way over here on the pendulum at the moment on bibliometrics, and it's starting to swing back. People are saying that's not everything. Okay, and eventually it'll get somewhere sensible, and then it'll swing in the other direction, and it'll go too far the other way, because <laughs> it always does. Sorry, I've, I've seen that cycle a couple of times now. Right. Do you want to do this one? Uh, if you want to do this, this is your slide, sorry, yeah. So this is what I was talking about earlier. So rather than trying to solve things with executable pipe, I don't want to talk too much about that. I just want to some contextual framework. What we really need is to have these online community resources like the benchmarking problems and all of the algorithms in the same place, coded up in the same way in a consistent framework so that you can actually compare different methods as they get invented. So you add that to a community resource that is curated by the community. And if you can do that, we can, I won't go through it. You can see what I mean because I've already talked about it. But that would solve the problem. Can we do things as a community where we work together to try and so address the problems we're interested in? So Ben has a lovely tree diagram as part of Pints, which shows you which algorithm you might think about using for a given type of problem. Can we actually make that really concrete? So a new researcher comes in and has a look, thinks his supervisor said you need to find an inference algorithm for this particular type of problem. Can you go to a single repository and say, okay, I've got this type of problem, can I follow it through? Try this one first. If that one doesn't work, then try this one. And it's principle because it's been shown to work against a set of benchmark problems that look like the problem that you've got. Now, no one group can do that for the reasons that you gave earlier. It's got to be a collective effort. We've all got to do it together. And we've got to agree those standards, the standards on coding, the standards on testing, the standards on the data, the standards on the benchmarks. You know, it's all got to be standardised. You know, we, we actually have a name for that too. It's standards-based research dissemination, which is a mouthful, but it's what we mean. And it's what we've got to move towards. It'll get us away from all these other problems. But we've got to agree on the standards, and then we've got to agree on the approach. And it needs to be, this sounds terrible, it needs to be your generation that does it. You know, I, I can, I can evangelise for it, but it's not going to happen in the next, probably not going to happen in the next 10 years, to be honest, not get to that point. But it might happen in the next 20, by which time I'll be well and truly retired and hopefully going for walks on the coastline in Cornwall. Um, so, but, you know, you, but, but it, we need to start having these conversations so that we stop having the conversation we had for the previous 50 minutes, you know, what are all the problems? I think there are solutions. I really think there are solutions, but it has to be of all, all of us working together to come up with those solutions. No one individual, one group will do it because it's too hard. And that's just, this doesn't just apply to inference, it applies to everything. You know, whatever we're trying to do in research, it applies to all of that stuff. Sorry, evangelizing stuff. <laughs> Something I've been going on about for a while. <laughs> yeah, Peter. Yeah, can I endorse what you've just said, but <laughs> I think there's an issue, if you're not careful, if you put down too many standards, you can suppress innovation. And that's something we have to be very careful of. The standards mustn't say you have to use MCMC because someone comes up with something that isn't MCMC and then they can't get it published because it's not MCMC. So you have to be very careful with standards that you leave enough loopholes <laughs> for clever people to slip through and do really innovative stuff. And that's what worries me about standards to some extent. 
So, so I absolutely agree, and I, I probably should have expressed what I meant by standards. So standards, I mean standards of coding practice, you know, things that we can agree on. Standards, of, standards for data formats and standards for model repositories. How do you actually, so that they become interoperable. So the standards are about interoperability, really, and standardization of storage, not about methods. You can't have standard methods. That's never going to work. You've got, I absolutely agree with you. But the other stuff, that's what holds us up. The fact that we don't have standards in all those areas is what makes it really difficult to make things interoperate. Can, can I follow up on that? I agree. Again, I totally agree. But I think standards, again, are going to have to evolve over yeah. time. Because if you have a standard of how we store stuff, yeah. Yeah. and how we store stuff now is not how we store stuff 20 years ago, no, 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 because well, but we also learn how to do it a lot better, and and I think we need to push that forward. And I agree that we need standards, but evolving standards and not revolutionary, but evolutionary standards that that change with time. No, um, this is perhaps more of a question because I don't absolutely don't know the answer to this, but. I really like the idea of having like a set of benchmark problems, but if you want to organize that in a community that's as large and as diffuse really as people who work on inference problems, how do you avoid the problem of like, there are 50 standards, I'm going to unify them all and now there's 51? <laughs> um, you talk to academic publishers and get them to do it for you, which is what we're doing. <laughs> So it has to be, there has to be some way that links it back to existing journals and publication modes, because we can't do it, we can't, we are where we are. So we started talking to major publishers, it's going to take, that's why it's going to take a while. But we've had a couple of really positive meetings. Yeah, because I mean, <laughs> one of the, one of the things that we've sort of been suggesting to them uh, quite tentatively is that perhaps some of the uh, research software engineering work might actually be something that the publishers might want to consider yeah. taking up. Um, it's quite a light touch conversation that at the moment, but I think it's uh, it's, it's it's something that that I don't know. Uh, journals are under continual pressure to demonstrate their worth, and that would be a way that they could for sure. Yeah, little known fact: Elsevier employ eight hundred software engineers. Okay. Hmm? They build the information platforms that everything sits on. So publishers now information platform providers basically, and so they've got armies of software engineers. Most of them are in Kidlington. <laughs> and I think they made they made more net or gross profit last year than Google. It's the the they're doing pretty well Elsevier. Yeah. So, um, okay. really. So this is the proposed <laughs> approach. So wouldn't be nice if we had this world. So instead of publishing a paper, it's a PDF, and it's effectively a tombstone on the day you publish it because it's static and you can't evolve it at all. And this comes back to Peter's point. It's all got to evolve. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a community curated repository with data, models, computational resources, all in this open repository, and publications with just updates on where we are? And it might be an update on the standards, it might be a discussion about the standards, it might be an update on the results in the papers, it might be an update on the benchmarks, but it becomes an evolving living repository that we are all rep responsible for. And we might elect com committees that actually look after it in a formal way in some way, or they might be the, you know, they might be called journals, this might be the front end of a journal, but it replaces the traditional journal with an online repository for what, that we can all contribute to and all make use of. Um, and again, coming back to the new DPhil student, this is where they go to. If they want to find out what's going on, what's the state of the art in the discipline, they come here and they can have a look because it's all laid out with benchmark problems and tutorial examples and everything else that would be lovely. Wouldn't that be nice? So anyway, this was drawn by a guy called Greg McInerney, who's now a, a lecturer in visualisation in Warwick, about eight years ago. <laughs> And we're still using it, so we made a little bit of progress on the way. But um, anyway, do you want to talk about pints? And that should be what uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, so I, I guess that one of the things that would be really great, actually, now I'm sort of thinking about it, would be if we were to organise this meeting again. I mean, almost what we could do is, you know, if, if anyone wanted to be involved, we could have almost a couple of days beforehand, where we sort of got everyone together and a bit of a hackathon to try and see if we could try and develop this this kind of community resource uh, just as a just as a very tentative suggestion um, so perhaps we'll think about that for next time that we organize this um, but yeah so yeah um, great I mean d does anyone have any final comments that they want to to say anything about this sure Joe
Yes, it might sound a bit cynical, but um, this is all a very good idea. But why haven't? Why hasn't it happened yet? <laughs> good question. Do you, want, do you want an answer? Yes, please. <laughs> It's a great big tanker. It takes a long time to turn it around. Is the real answer. And also, there's you know, there's vested interest. I mean, how would it, how do we turn a publishing model that's been the same publishing model since Newton on its head? I mean, that's what we're effectively saying. It's not going to happen overnight. It needs people to start doing it. And so we, you know, Pint is one example. There's other. There's lots of other examples out there. As more examples are, are put in front of publishers, they'll start thinking this is a really good idea. So we just need to start talking about it a lot. And it will, it will pass on, you know, it will take a while. It will take, you know, 10, 20 years or something to start getting somewhere. There will be some really good, and some areas aren't mature enough to do this. But there are some really good examples out there. I mean, the protein database is a fantastic example of a, of a standards-based database where it works. Everybody conforms to that standard, and, you can, and there's software associated with it, and you, comp, you can compare protein structures straightforwardly. And that was a community-based effort. So there are several of those. I mean, the ones who started it all are particle physicists. Remember, the, the internet was invented by particle physicists so that they could share data with one another and so that people in Brazil could work on a data set even though they didn't have a large hadron collider down the road. So there's loads of examples of this kind of thing having been done in science. But biology does not have the equivalent of the large hadron collider and it doesn't have the equivalent of the internet because we haven't invented it yet. But this might be our version of it. Is that all right? I hope that's not too, too, too um, you know, it's, it's ambitious, you know, it's all, you know, altruistic and all that stuff. But I think it's the way we've got to go if we're really going to make progress on systems biology level problems. We're not going to make progress otherwise. Great. With that, I, I suggest what we do is perhaps close the session. Can we everyone thank Dave? For <laughs>